Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Amber Nightingale Sultani, the Associate State Director for Community Outreach with AARP here in Northern Virginia. And I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. AARP Virginia is thrilled to continue our collaboration with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. This collaboration allows us an opportunity to bring our members a sampling of the rich programs that is offered each semester by Ali Mason. From our earliest beginnings, AARP has been a champion of lifelong learning. Our founder, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrews, once said, the eagerness to learn, to pioneer in the development of new skills and new abilities, to broaden the personal scopes of understanding, to freshen the mind with new ideas and new concepts, to achieve new heights of knowledge has no age restriction. Those words are as true today as when she spoke them in the 1950s. Studies have shown that challenging your brain in new ways throughout your life may strengthen your brain. Our brain is stimulated and makes new connections when we learn new things or pursue new interests. So AARP encourages you to stay curious and give yourself a good mental workout by doing something that challenges your thinking, offers you enjoyment, and encourages you to grapple with new and complex ideas. And I hope today's lecture will do that for you and more. Thank you again for joining us. Greetings and warm welcome from Ollie Mason. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University has been in existence for over 30 years. We offer lectures, clubs, special events, and trips, as well as many volunteer opportunities such as teaching and service on committees. There are many things you can learn and do at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. We're very happy to be collaborating today with AARP, and I wanna welcome all of our OLLI members, as well as those of you who are coming in from Virginia and across the United States. We're very happy that you've joined us today, and we hope that you will look at our website to learn more about OLLI at Ollie, O L L I dot G M U dot E D U. Please enjoy today's presentation. Once again, this class is the American West. This is session 204, and our speaker is Richard Stilson. And Richard, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Is that yes, it? I I see your slides and remember annotate. Oh, that's right. I got to do that all over again. Yes, sir. Okay. Can people yes. see the little red dot? Yes, sir. Okay. Wonderful. So, are we ready? Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> I hope everyone got the slides that I sent out from the first week. If you did not get them and you'd like them, please just email me. My email address is right there and I'll send them to you. Last week, I talked a bit about Indian history on the plains. There is so much Indian history in, in the West of the United States, of course, and this was the barest touch. Even on the plains, we barely mentioned the complex histories of the many groups of the Sioux or Lakota and the Blackfeet, who for centuries descend, defended their territory in the Bitterroot Mountains. In the Southwest, there's an equally long and interesting history of the migrations of the Pueblos. My next course will be about that. The Navajos, the Apache, and the story of the Hopi, which is one of the Pueblo prides tribes, but living in the middle of Arizona, smack in the middle of the Navajo reservation. In California, there's the treatment of Indians by the Spanish missionaries and the catastrophe for them of the California gold rush. In the Northwest, the history of the coastal tribes and of the Nez Perce. And finally, even the Alaskan tribal groups from the Klingon to the various groups of Eskimos. Indian history, one of my 
main interests is not just their contact with whites. Indian history has its own stories to tell independent of the whites. It's rich, fascinating, and complex. But today, we're gonna to talk about the whites. In the 19th century West, now I can't cover all the 19th century in one and a half hours, so I'll highlight a few aspects that I think are important and that I hope you find interesting. Oops. Remember the map? Gotta know the map, gotta know the territory. With all the history we'll be going over, please keep the map in mind. It's important. Well, first let's do a little bit of a review from last time. Remember the Spanish exploration and settlement in the Southwest around Santa Fe. We didn't talk too much about that because we were more interested in the Indians, but it's true, the Spanish settled around Santa Fe, developed a colony that covered most of New Mexico and all of Texas, as well as the area around Santa Fe. They, there were huge effects on Indian lifestyle. Remember the horse, disease, and guns. And finally, the great migrations of major tribes onto the plains and the dominance of tribes <clears throat> which could best use the horses and the guns. Now, independent of what was happening on the plain in Europe, Napoleon was establishing his empire, but he was getting bogged down in Haiti and in Spain. He needed money and he sold Louisiana, a very large territory the French had claimed in the West to the new and weak United States. For him, it was a winning transaction because he thought it was a worthless wilderness. And anyway, the United States was too new and too weak to worry about. It was not the only mistake Napoleon made, but that was a big one. Who did he sell it to? He's the man, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is one of the most interesting of the early founding fathers, along with Hamilton, a very, very different kind of guy. Jefferson was a scholar and somewhat of a scientist, and he was obsessed with the West from a very early date. He had the largest geographical library in the country, and he had every English and French map that he could get of the West. So he did know a little bit. But most Americans really had no idea. At the time, you can tell from letters, uh, uh, even in Jefferson, that many thought the West, like Napoleon, was basically an empty, worthless wilderness. Jefferson knew better. However, there was an important caveat to that worthless wilderness. The primary thought and misconception was that there had to be a water route to the Pacific, the Northwest Passage. This was the golden grail of the West in the very early uh, 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 centuries, right from when Henry Hudson sailed up the uh, Hudson River trying to find the fable Northwest Passage. The Louisiana Purchase, as far as Jefferson was concerned, was a way to find this, or at least that's the way he sold it to Congress. However, the Louisiana Purchase, as you can see, did not go to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, it didn't even really get to the Rocky Mountains. So it wasn't quite as um, comprehensive as Jefferson would have liked. Well, none of that bothered Jefferson very much. He still thought of the West as going to the Pacific 
and that it should be American. So Jefferson sold the idea of a very large expedition. He sold it to Congress again because of searching for the Northwest Passage. And he hired his secretary and good friend and neighbor, Meriwether Lewis, to lead the thing, at least as far as the administration and the scientific part of it. And he hired William Clark, the son of the famous Revolutionary War um, leader, George, Rosh George Rogers Clark. He thought, well, with these two, I can mount an expedition that will serve a lot of purposes. Oops, excuse me for a second. The expedition was a big one probably the biggest that the little old United States of the time could possibly put together. He called it the core of discovery. This is an, uh, an estimate of his budget put together by a historian. This is not a, uh, a document from the history. His idea was to map the route carefully and scientifically with frequent observations of latitude and longitude. And so you see a fairly large part of his budget was mathematical instruments. And that was what it was for. Jefferson's instructions to Lewis included a detailed journal, which quote, was to be rendered to the war office and indeed, the Corps of Discoveries administratively was put in the army. Jefferson knew about the Indians who lived on the plains, mainly from the French. And a major objective of the Corps of Discovery was to find out about their economy, the relations between the tribes, their languages, and even their state of morality and religion quote, to better enable those who endeavor to civilize and instruct them. Ooh, that sounds a bit ominous. And you'll see that there was a fair amount of money allocated to arms and accoutrements, which were very much military. And the rest of it was pretty much for the trip, except this line. The largest line by far in his budget, Indian presence. The Indians were very important to the core of discovery. Okay. This was the famous Lewis and Clark expedition. If you want to have a, a very interesting read, take a look at uh, Ambrose's book, Undaunted Courage, it's in the reading list. It's, it's a very good read and it's good history as well. Well, they didn't walk, you know. The idea was they were to sail up the Missouri River all the way to the mountains, which was the edge of the uh, Louisiana Purchase. It was a large group, 35 to 45 people and a prodigious amount of equipment you saw from the budget. They traveled in three boats, two large pirogues and a smaller boat. This is one of the larger pirogues. You can see that it had both sail and oars. And the Missouri was navigable most of the way. And so um, they knew that mostly from the French. Well, what was their route? They started in St. Louis and just followed the Missouri River all the way up on the first um, 
first day and ended up at Fort Mandan. Fort Mandan really was not an army fort. It was an Indian village, the Mandan Indians. The Mandans were very friendly and the French were there. There was a French trader, Tuisson Charbonneau, and they hired him and one of his wives, a pregnant Shoshone teenager. I'm sure you know the name, Sacagawea. And then they wintered there. And then the next day, they continued up the Missouri to Great Falls. That's where they hit the wall, OK? You just can't get beyond there in boats or even in wagons. They abandoned their boats and then went south along the wall. And at Three Forks is where three rivers come together in form the Yellowstone River. They hired a Shoshone guide. They already had Tuisson knew Shoshone language and then Sacagawea was there, okay? They got the Shoshone to show them a way across the Bitterroot Mountains. The Bitterroots are the Northern part of the Rockies. They are very Alpine mountains. They are very formidable. They got across the mountains and then headed straight north on the other side of the Bitter Roots and eventually got to Palouse country. Remember Palouse country where my alma mater is? When they got there, they then headed straight west across the Columbia Basin and ended up at Astoria at roughly the mouth of the Columbia River. That's where they wintered the second time. They had some trouble with the Indians there, but it was okay for a while. And then they headed back quickly because they had all the scientific information. They have uh, very, very detailed notes. And so they headed all the way back. When they got to the Bitterroots, Clark decided, I'm going to look for a shortcut. Why do we have to go south and then back north? So Lewis took the big expedition and followed the old route. Clark took a, a few soldiers and, and people to carry the stuff they needed to go straight across the bitter routes. And there, of course, he saw and ran into and skirmished with the Blackfeet Indians. In one skirmish, he killed one of the Blackfeet. And that began an enmity that lasted more than a century. The Blackfeet did not like the whites. There is a uh, portrait of a Blackfeet, Blackfoot warrior. Well, once they got together again, back in uh, Three Rivers, and they sailed now down the Missouri all the way back to St. Louis. It was a huge three-year expedition and hugely successful. The notes, by the way, uh, the journals of, of Lewis mostly, um, can be read. They've been translated and put together and uh, I, it's not on the reading list because it's, you know, <laughs> it's not really a history. Ambrose is better than, than the history, but it's interesting to read if you, if you want to find the uh, reports of Lewis. When they got back, they sent all of the, everything to Jefferson and Jefferson reorganized the core of discovery into what he called the topographical engineers. That was an important agency that lasted about 80 years and was actually the part of the army that did most of the exploration and mapping of the West. Famous explorers like Stephen Long, James Pike, and the most famous of all, John, uh, John Charles Fremont, were all part 
of the topographical engineers. They did more to map the West than any other white group until the California gold rush. That's the, the government side. But you know, the government wasn't the only group that went into the West. Here are the, um, the seal of the Corps of Discoveries and the topographical engineers. <laughs> Notice in the seal, the shaking of the hands of the Indians and the whites. Um, this one's the whites. I have no idea what the guy had in mind when he drew this back in uh, 1804, but um, he seemed to think the Indians had gloves of some sort. Oh, well, they didn't. What, what else was happening in the West beside these government expeditions? Well, for almost a hundred years, there was a fashion of making hats out of beaver pelts. Now, the beaver pelt is not the fur side, it's under the fur. And it's a complicated process, uh, one, which involved mercury, by the way. You've heard the phrase mad hatter. Yeah, it's true. Um, mercury was not a very uh, good thing to be <laughs> breathing in while you're making your hats. But it, this fashion created a huge market for beaver pelts. Now the French and the English had for a long time, for over hundred years, uh, been trading with the Indians for beaver pelts. It was a good relationship with the, most of the Western Indians who would go out and uh, trap the beaver and then sell them to the um, Hudson Bay Company traders and the French traders for guns, ammunition, metal tools, and importantly, but unfortunately, liquor. Uh, the Indians did like the liquor. Now, when the Americans came on after the Lewis and Clark expedition, there were many who went into the mountains, but they didn't trade with the Indians. They competed with them. They were trappers. The American mountain men trapped the beaver in competition with the Indians, created a lot of difficulties. And in the northern part of the Rocky Mountains, much of the enmity of various Indi Indian tribes was created by that competition. Well, who were these mountain men? Uh, this is kind of the popular image of a mountain man, right? Remember Jeremiah Johnson, that movie about mountain men? And, uh, you know, he was supposed to be a woodsman, a mountain climber, a loner, didn't like any society, didn't like people uh, and lived by himself up in the mountains. Uh, this guy, by the way, William Gordon, was a pretty minor mountain man. Uh, his main, aim, his main uh, fame is having this portrait made. But you know, most of the mountain men are not like that at all. This is Jim Bridger. This is much more like what the mountain men were like. The mountain men were in it for the money, right? It's not so much that they loved the mountains and they would live, live by themselves there for years. Although there were some like that, I'm sure. Um, but Jim Bridger, he was a real trapper, um, but at a reasonable age, he decided that he could make much more money as a trader than as a trapper. And he opened a trading post. It became quite a famous trading post. The way the system worked is that the mountain men and the Indians would hunt uh, <clears throat> the beaver, would trap them. And then every year they would sort of get together in what was called a rendezvous. The rendezvous was well known. There was various 
places that it occurred, mostly at the um, at the head of the Green River, this uh, large area. And what would happen is that they would bring these beaver pelts in and trade it with people like Jim Bridger for guns, ammunition, liquor. And they were peaceful. The, their, I mean, not completely, of course, but um, there was no great wars started at, the, uh, at these rendezvous. And they, um, until the end of the mountain men era, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, this was really the best relations with Indians. There would be a big camp with the um, mountain men, the whites, and people from the East who bought most of the beaver pelts. And the Indians would be around the center of the, um, of the rendezvous. It was a system that worked for about 10, 12 years. And um, it worked pretty well. And Jim Bridger got fairly rich as a trader in these systems. But there were others who got much, much richer. The way the pelts were sold, they were sold to people from two main fur companies. One was John Jacob Astor's American Fur Company. Now, Astor never went to the West. He was from New York City and he stayed there, but his company was huge and successful. And he literally became the richest man in the United States at the time. There was another one, Ashley, who was a Westerner and a trapper, but like Bridger, gave it up early to establish the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. This was both in St. Louis and to go into competition with Astor's American Fur Company. They would take wagons to the rendezvous and they would then trade for what the uh, mountain men and the Indians needed for the beaver pelts. Then they would take the beaver pelts all the way back to the east and be able to some, to some extent uh, export them mainly to England, uh, but also to make hats themselves with the beaver pelts. Well, that was in the Northern Rockies. In the Southern Rockies, something else was happening that included the white men. In 1821, the Mexicans won their independence from Spain. And there was a trade that was established along what was called the Santa Fe Trail. Now the Santa Fe Trail started in Missouri and with very large wagons, the, the big Conestoga wagons, they were able on this trail to go Southwest all the way to the Arkansas River where they continued to follow the Arkansas and then down over the Raton Pass in New Mexico to Santa Fe where they sold their goods and what they sell them for? Well, the main thing, can you guess? Silver. Silver was mined in Upper Mexico and was very valuable in the US. They also had another um, interesting uh, import to Missouri and that was mules. You've heard of the Missouri mules? Well, the uh, Missouri mules came very much from the Southwest, from the Spanish, and then after 1821 Mexicans. Uh, and this trade was very successful for about 15 years. Now there were problems. After all, they had to cross the Southern Plains. That's where the Cheyenne were, the, um, the Comanches, and a little farther south, 
the uh, the Apache, and they had quite a few um, skirmishes with these Indians, but they traveled in relatively large trains with these huge wagons. And um, so they were successful in, um, in doing the trade. There was also a cutoff, uh, the Cimarron cutoff that was used, but the trade was again, like the Northern Rockies, fairly successful. It lasted from about 1820 to roughly 1840. And it also made fortunes of a lot of people in Western uh, Missouri. Okay, this is the beginning of the Americans in the West, the Lewis and Clark expedition and the Southwest trade. Uh, maybe we can stop if anybody has a question that they put in the chat room. Um, this might be a good time to, to uh, answer them. Anything? Uh, there's nothing in the chat right now. Okay, well, we'll go on. Remember last week I said I wasn't gonna talk much about Texas and our trip around the Rockies did not include Texas. Texas was huge. Texas was a completely different history, but you can't really talk about the West and the Americans in the West without talking about Texas. So now we're gonna do a bit of Texas history. But first, you can't do Texas history unless you know something about the new state of Mexico. Oops. Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821. It was a huge country because it encompassed almost all of what we now call the West, the West of the Louisiana, West of the Louisiana Purchase. Most of the people were down around the Mexican plateau, stealing gold from the Aztecs and the like. And was, oops, my mouse. The area north of uh, the, uh, the Chihuahua Desert was pretty much a wilderness. There were only two places where the Spanish really established themselves. One was around Santa Fe, Where's the Rio Grande? It's probably right about here, where there was a substantial Spanish colony that really grew out of Coronado's original uh, visit. And the other was along the coast of California, where the Franciscans established a system of missions and kind of got the, uh, conquered the coastal Indians in California to work for them. Uh, and the idea was that they were supposed to be converted. Don't think the conversion went very well, but with the work of the Indians, the missions thrived until Mexico became an independent state. And Mexico was not very interested in these missions and they let them go to ruin for the most part. So we have Mexico, two areas where they colonized and they knew absolutely nothing about the bulk of the Northern part of their country. That is when they, when they got um, their independence. Okay, well, there was a Santa Fe trade so they knew something about Americans. Um, but they were concerned, or at least this guy was concerned. He was one of the first revolutionaries that achieved Mexican independence. Dear old Antonio de Padua Maria Severino Lopez de Santa Ana. And let's just call him Santa Ana. Um, he was an aristocrat, a general, and really established the first government of Mexico. Well, he was very worried 
about his Northern territories, but not about Americans. He was worried about the French and the English for the most part, even the Russians. The US was too weak to worry about. But he did have the idea, maybe he could get Americans to come and settle and provide a population in what is now Texas to uh, defend the territory for him from the English and the French for the most part. He made a large land grant in what is now southeastern Texas to Moses Austin. Austin was a Virginian and the deal was if Austin could get Americans to settle in this area, and he didn't think much of the area anyway, um, he would deed the land over to them, but on the condition that they agree that they will be Mexican citizens and Roman Catholic. Well, okay, Moses' son, Stephen Austin, made it happen. And by 1830, there were roughly 300 American settlers living in Mexican Texas. They did convert, but only nominally, to both Mexican citizenship and Roman Catholicism. They were predominantly Protestant. Well, Southeastern Texas is almost indistinguishable from Western Louisiana. And Austin attracted a lot of Southern plantation owners so they could expand their cotton growing, and it does grow cotton in Southeastern Texas, and their slave holdings. Now, at this time in the US, slavery was about the most important issue both social and political. Interestingly, Santa Ana didn't cotton much to slavery, the pun is intended. Um, and he proclaimed slavery outlawed in all of Mexico, including the Northern Mexico of Texas. Silly Santa Ana. Hardly anything was more important to these American settlers, mostly Southern plantation owners, than slavery. They were not likely to countenance the abolition of slavery. They were fighting that tooth and nail from abolitionists in the North of the US. In 1835, Austin settlers proclaimed independence from Mexico. Santa Ana got together an army to invade and to subdue these independent-minded Americans. Remember, one of the first things Santa Ana's army did in marching north was to come up to the Alamo in what is now Austin and besiege it. Everybody, I guess, knows the story, Davy Crockett and all of that. Um, he managed, Santana managed to sack the Alamo, kill most of the people there, but not everybody. And everybody started to retreat straight east. Santa Ana followed them towards the Brazos River. Now, Sam Houston had been chosen as commander of the Revolutionary Army, and he kept retreating to roughly where Houston is now. And he made a stand at a place called San Jacinto. Jacinto. It's about 20 miles from downtown Houston today. He defeated Santa Ana. This was not the Alamo. And he captured Santa Ana personally. Pretty much under threat of death, he made a deal to release Santa Ana if he would take his Mexican army and withdraw it out of Texas. And this was the final battle of the Texan Revolution. You can see from the map 
the story of Santa Ana's invasion into Texas. He first had a battle in the Alamo. There was another army, a smaller army from Mexico that came up from the south. But Santa Ana kept after Houston. April 21st, 1836, there was the Battle of San Jacinto. And Santa Ana agreed to withdraw both armies back into Mexico. The Republic of Texas was born. Here was the man of the hour, Sam Houston. He was elected the president of Texas, the Republic of Texas, an independent country, not part of the United States. And indeed, although he wanted to join the United States, he valued his independence and used that the, that he was an independent country as a way to negotiate with the president of the United States, oops, that guy, Polk. He negotiated the entrance of Texas on his terms, terms that were very different than any of the other states. Polk was so interested in getting Texas into the country that he agreed to a lot of very interesting conditions. First, Texas would be a slave state. That did not bother Polk. Polk was from Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee. He was a slave owner. And uh, so as far as he was concerned, that was fine. But some of the other things were rather different. Texas was to keep title of its land. Now in the rest of the West, the federal government owned all of the land, except for maybe a small part in private hands. The Louisiana Purchase, all of the land of the Louisiana Purchase reverted to the federal government. But Houston says, no, 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 not in Texas. If we're gonna be a state, we own the land that is in Texas. Another, interesting thing is Texas retained the right to deal with Indians. Now, up to now, you remember the Plains Wars and um, the uh, Sand Creek Massacre and all of the ramifications of that. This was all dealing with the federal government right from the time of Jefferson. Congress retained the right to deal with the Indians. And remember the establishment of Indian reservations, not in Texas. Sam Houston would not have reservations where Indians would stay in Texas. His final condition, which was also very unusual, was what amounted to a state army, the Texas Rangers. They were definitely a, paramil a paramilitary group. And indeed, they won the Red River War against the poor Cheyenne, and they became and still are mostly a police force, but they have many more powers than most state police. Okay, Texas, part of the United States, but on its own conditions. There's dear Mr. Polk. He's a one-term president. Um, and although he was born in North Carolina, he lived most of his life in Tennessee and became a governor, the governor of Tennessee. He was a Jacksonian and he was the last of the Jacksonians to get elected. He was extremely expansionist. He wanted Texas and he used Texas as a pretext to go to war with Mexico. He created some incidences on the, um, uh, on the border and he didn't care how he got Mexico. He sent his army not on the border, but Zach Taylor, 
a future president, invaded Mexico, finally conquered Mexico City, and the Mexicans gave up. And there was a treaty at the end of this war that the Americans won, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Guadalupe Hidalgo ceded the whole of Northern Mexico to the United States. That's a lot. And it was January, 1848. The spoils of war, about a quarter of the US and over a third of Mexico. And as you can see, includes all of the state of what is now California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and about half of New Mexico. <laughs> Notice that the Western half of Mexico is not included in the Mexican secession because that was the Republic of Texas and now the state of Texas. 1848, guess what happened also in 1848? Over here in um, the San Francisco Bay Area and a little bit to the east along the American River, John Sutter was building a, a, um, a, a mill, a wood mill to, uh, to provide lumber to the growing area in the northern part of um, the Mexican Texas. Guess what happened? Marshall, one of the workers, discovered some shiny stones in the tail race that they were building. Picked it up, said, this looks like gold. Took it to Sutter, Sutter took it to an assayist in San Francisco. And it was not only gold, it was the purest gold that this assayist had ever seen. He said, you did not pick this up off of the ground. This is processed. But actually they did pick it up off the ground. Well, there was more found and they tried to keep it secret, but no chance whatsoever. And within a few months, the words got all the way back to the East. There is indeed gold in them thar hills. President Polk in the last year of his presidency proclaimed in his State of the Union message, which was given in December rather than what is now given in February. Um, he said, there's gold in California. You see, I told you the Mexican war was worthwhile. There's enough gold in California to pay for the whole war and a lot more. You just pick it up off the ground. Well, that was a message that was very well received. And indeed, there was gold fever. Tens of thousands of people decided they had to go to the West. Now, these were mostly working people maybe earning a dollar a day, um, and farmers who might have been quite a bit in debt. And this was uh, what they thought was their way out. They would go to California, pick up the gold, and then come back east home. They weren't interested in staying in California. But, okay, you wanted to go to California to get to the gold? There are a few problems. How are you going to get there, Greenhorn? What about the deserts, the mountains, and Indians? Do you know how to mine gold? How are you going to get the gold back? How are you going to get yourself back? There were no answers to these questions in the East in 1848. Now, unfortunately, if they could have read my book, which is what it's all about, they would have solved their problems. It was not available. Okay, so a little plug. I hope you don't mind. They got information 
from newspapers, from guidebooks, from some of the mountain men who sold their services to guide them. And they had a long trail. The California and Oregon Trail went up the Platte River all the way over the uh, Laramie Mountains, down a little south of some other mountains and got to the door, right? The South Pass. Then the California Trail dipped down south and back north, eventually going to Fort Hall, which was um, a fort established to protect mountain men and uh, particularly against the, um, the Blackfeet. Quite a trip. It wasn't too bad, except it was very long. Now, one guy, a mountain man named Sublet, managed to, um, to establish a trail that wagons can go on uh, across, across this triangle, saved about two weeks, which was very good. And indeed, in the Western part, these cutoffs that mountain men could take were very important. Now remember, they were in wagons. It wasn't as if they could climb the wall like the mountain men or like the Lewis and Clark expedition did. In the West, here's Fort Hall. The West, they started the Oregon Trail, followed the of the river until it finally got up to the Columbia and then got to Oregon. Now the California gold rushers, they didn't want to go to Oregon. They wanted to get gold in California. So they cut south eventually along the Humboldt River and kept going across the sink. Remember the sink? And to the Sierras, the second wall. They actually got over the Sierras, but generally not with their wagons. Many had to dip, uh, ditch their wagons to get across the Sierras and finally into California. That was the trip. That was quite a trip. It really changed everything. The migrants, there were something like 40,000 40,000 in one year in 1849. Those were the 49ers. In 1850, it was even more. And there were another 30, 40,000 who went by Panama. That's a different story. It was the largest internal migration in the United States. And, you know, still is. Well, a lot of people in the East made fun of them, of course. I love this Courier and Ives lithograph of uh, the gold rusher, the pot on his head, his pan, but he also had to have a teapot. He had a little spade as his shovel. And of course he carried his clothes in a suitcase. What else? And look at these boots, shiny, lovely boots. Uh, maybe not so good in crossing the Rocky Mountains, but still, that was uh, a uh, clever depiction making fun of the gold rushers. But actually, these New York shopkeepers and farmers, most of them made it across the country. Quite remarkable. And indeed, there was gold. In 10 years, there was something like 300 to $500 million of gold mined. Now, a lot of these individuals didn't get very much out of it. Um, if you read my book or take my course on the gold rush, uh, I go into that. But indeed, there really was gold. Now, think of the Indians. These people were crossing right across the Great Plains, 
where there was so much turmoil and the fighting between the Lakota and the Cheyenne. But look, this is a sketch made of the one of the gold rush companies up to South Pass, South Pass is up here. 40,000, there were many, many of them. They were mostly organized in companies, not individuals. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I usually take my phone and hide it, but um, I couldn't there. Can you imagine a Lakota chief sitting up here on the hills looking at this? There's no way they're going to disturb these people. 40,000 armed to the teeth. So they had, the gold rushers had very, very little problems with the Great Plains Indians. The Lakota and the Cheyenne kept fighting each other, but not with the, um, not with the whites. And then you remember 1851, the Treaty of Fort Laramie, where they got the Lakota and Cheyenne to separate, and they separated along this trail, along the Platte River, the Lakota to the north and the Cheyenne to the south. Well, they got to California. And the center of California in the gold rush was San Francisco. Everything had to come through San Francisco. It was the port that was nearest the gold fields, which were in the foothills of the Sierras. And it was a convenient place to distribute pretty much everything from San Francisco. They go up the bay, up the American River to the Sacramento River going north or the San Joaquin River going south, and then could distribute goods to the various gold rush camps. So in 1848, San Francisco was nothing. There was a presidium there that dated from the Spanish days. And that was it. By 1851, it was a roaring city. You can see from this photograph, and this is a true photograph, of um, San Francisco in 1851. And then after the gold rush, San Francisco continued to grow and essentially became the capital of the whole West. It's where finance was arranged, it was manufacturing, and it grew to a substantial population, even a very large, this is a hotel, can you imagine, in 1875. San Francisco was important. What were some of the things that were needed when they got to the gold? Well, first, transportation. Transportation was absolutely crucial. The gold rushers had that big march across the country. Well, that wouldn't do. And also within California, they needed transportation. And Wells Fargo, in a kind of complicated story, got market leadership and established stagecoaches. Anybody know where the stagecoach was made? Not in San Francisco. It was in Concord, Massachusetts. And they call them Concord stages. There were many. And there was a network of transportation within California, mostly through the stages. And in every little place in the, in the uh, gold rush camps, in the new cities that were starting to grow uh, at various nodes leading to the gold rush, there was always a Western Union office and a place where the Concord stage would, uh, would stop. But that wasn't good enough. You couldn't take Concord stages across the country, although there was some attempts at doing exactly that. So the railroads were to solve the problem. 
The history of the railroads is very interesting and complex all by itself. And indeed, you can read another book by Ambrose, um, nothing like it in the world. It's on the reading list. In the West, people like Henry Huntington and Leland Stanford and Charles Crocker got together enough finance and enough organization to start building the Transcontinental Railroad from the West to the East. They called it the Central Railroad. It was built mostly by Chinese immigrants. In the East, there were other financiers, including, for instance, Vanderbilt, who started building the Transcontinental Railroad from the East to the West. And guess who their main workers were? The Irish. So you had the Transcontinental Railroad basically being built by the Chinese and the Irish, uh, both very recent um, immigrants. But it worked. And pretty soon, this was 1860. Uh, I think it was 1869 when they met in, uh, in Utah and this famous picture, this extremely famous picture of the two, the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific meeting and the Transcontinental Railroad was done. Well, when the railroads got across, and you could actually travel from coast to coast in a reasonable way, not in a stagecoach, for instance, things started to grow. There were companies that started in the gold rush that possibly you didn't realize. You probably did realize that Levi Strauss began in the gold rush, but very small. They really became a big com company um, 10, 15 years later, but Strauss was a gold rusher. And he came up with this idea of using denim, a very tough kind of cotton for trousers that gold rushers would be able to use. It's still there, Levi Strauss. I am wearing a pair of Levi's right now. Giardelli. You probably know Giardelli chocolate. If you don't, you should try it. It's great chocolate. Giardelli was actually an Italian, came into the gold rush, but he was a chocolater and he quickly realized he could make a lot more money making chocolate and selling it to the gold rush rather than mining. In fact, most of the people who made huge fortunes, including for instance, Leland Stanford, from who established Stanford University 40 years later, um, made their money not mining gold, but mining the miners. And that's the people who really got rich. Well, here's a couple of others you may not have known. Studebaker. Studebaker was a San Francisco company and it made carriages. Now they were not as good as the Concord stages, but they managed to survive and they stayed in business all along into the 20th century until they decided to try their hand at cars. Who remembers Studebakers as a car? Probably the worst car ever made in the United States. And, uh, the company then went bankrupt with cars. But it did, but making carriages, they did very well all the way back to the gold rush days. Spreckles sugar, that still exists. Um, now it did not become big until well after the gold rush, but still another company which really got its foundations in San Francisco. But once the transportation was developed, other industries began. Anaconda copper. 
copper became king in terms of mining. Anaconda was one of the largest of the copper mining and smelting companies. They were mostly in Montana. Um, Butte, Montana became one of the wealthiest cities in the, in the country, um, except for San Francisco, but built on copper mining. Now with the railroads, they could mine it and get it back to the Midwest and the East where other companies could do something with it. Cattle. Now that's kind of interesting because there were a lot of people who had moved to the West and there wasn't very much in the way of meat. The agriculture was good, but not so much meat. Well, down in Texas, cattle, remember wild, the cattle could um, like the horses. They really loved the prairies. And there was a great deal of wild cattle, particularly in, um, in Southern Texas. Well, once the railroads got built, they thought, right, if we can get the cattle up the North to the railheads in Kansas, then we can sell the cattle for quite a lot. And indeed the great cattle drives, which basically they went up what was called the Chisholm Trail. They lasted from about 1870 through about 1890, not a long period. But during that period, the, the image of the cowboy and the great cattle drives was a reality. Well, by the turn of the 20th century, another industry dominated the West. That was oil. This is a picture of Spindle Top in Texas. The oil was in two places, actually, in Texas and in California, in the Los Angeles area. There are still oil wells in the Los Angeles area. You can drive by on the, uh, on Interstate, uh, what's it, 405 uh, near Long Beach and see oil wells. You just see the pumps going, you don't see a big derrick. And indeed there is actually an oil well in Beverly, <laughs> Beverly Hills High School. Can you imagine? Still pumping oil. And it paid for a good part of the Los Angeles school system. I think actually they stopped pumping, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, but it was pumping all that time. Okay. We have growth in the West. The West is doing pretty well. There were the Indian wars that were going on at the, um, in the 1870s and 80s, the Lakota never agreed on a uh, reservation. The Cheyenne kept breaking out. The Comanches in the Southern part of the plains were raiding all the way, but it was growing. But one interesting fact is, as I said before, the feds owned almost all the land the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican uh, secession, the Indian reservation system, all of that land, except in Texas, of course, reverted to federal ownership. It still is federal ownership. Even today, the feds own most of the land in the Western US. I found this map which I thought was rather interesting. Okay, this is 2004. In Nevada, the federal government owns 85% of the state. Okay, that's not a small amount. Even in California, 
the federal government owns about half of the state. It's extraordinary. Same in Oregon and in Idaho. Now, how does the federal government own this kind of thing? It's through various agencies. Some are obvious, like the national parks uh, and the military. And the military owns a huge amount of land in the West. But an agency that you may not have realized, two agencies, one is the federal, <clears throat> the Interior Department, um, what's it called, uh, Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Reclamation with the dams. And of course, the National Parks and Monuments and the National Forests. The military and Indian reservation is also owned by the government, but in a rather different way. And we'll just, we'll get to that in a minute. But the interesting thing is that there's this mythology of the Western like the mountain man, standing up for individualism, standing up for doing everything himself or herself. And yet they're dependent very, very much on the federal government. It's the federal government who really made the West. Just a thought that um, people don't realize. Again, Texas is an exception. Look, the federal government owns very little of the land in Texas, 2%. And a lot of that is military. Texas is always an exception. Okay, let's get back to the Indians. Now, all this was happening while the Great Plains were in a ferment and Sand Creek, after all, occurred during the Civil War. And after the Civil War, there was a problem. First Grant then, and then Johnson had to know what to do with this huge Western area that had all of these um, people who, as far as they were concerned, were just causing trouble. And yet after Sand Creek, there was this big sympathy for Indians in the West. And what, what was established was the Peace Party. There was a report, Doolittle Report, 1867, a couple of years after the Civil War. And this proclaimed the Indians were dying out and had to be protected. And how would they be protected? They'd be protected in reservations. The reservations would be run by a new bureau, a Bureau of Indian Affairs. And that in turn would be more or less run by various church groups who were leading the peace party. a peace commissioners group were sent out to negotiate treaties for the peaceful retreat of tribes into protected reservations and that they would be governed by the Indian Bureau. Now the army disagreed. Sherman and Grant stayed as very important uh, military leaders after the Civil War. They argued that on the plains and in the Southwest, the Indians had not been subdued and did not want to go into reservations. That if they were not forced, progress would be stopped. The progress that was really being driven by the railroads. A strong military presence was required, particularly to protect the Transcontinental Railroad. And so they said Indian treaties, fine, but there would have to be a very large military uh, presence. So, oops, excuse me. So what happened? 
By the end of the Civil War, most of the tribes, except tribes like the Lakota, Cheyenne, Comanche, Apache, they had been defeated and President Grant established this peace party and the Indian Commission. But there was no consensus. And in particular, the Plains Indians like the Lakota, the Cheyenne, Comanche and Apache did not agree to the peace commissioners. And the Plains Wars against the whites really began after the Civil War in the 1870s. The Indian agents that were appointed to run the reservations that were established, they were called agencies. And in order to establish the reservations, the peace commissioners agreed on annuities. These were payments, really bribes to the Indians to stay on the reservation, mostly food and some money. But the agents were frequently appointed by Quakers and Protestant church leaders who actually knew nothing about the Indians of the West and they had another agenda. They wanted to convert the energy. Well, Grant appointed, Grant, now president, appointed Sherman of his March through Georgia, uh, Georgia fame as the architect of the post-war army that had to have a substantial presence on the plains. General Sher Sheridan was appointed commander of the Western region. All of these civil, famous Union Civil War generals. The Americans began flooding into the West and the army was building up in order to protect them and subdue particularly the Lakota and the Cheyenne and the Comanche and the Apache. Well, the Peace Commission could not control the white settlers, so the reservations were frequently violated by whites. And the various chiefs couldn't control their young warriors who felt that the chiefs had sold them out. Also, many of these reservations made no sense. There was no way that the tribes could support themselves in the places where the um, the reservations were, um, were established. So the annuities were established to at least keep the uh, Indians fed, but they were insufficient. And there was no oversight. Indian agents stole a lot of the money. Wars broke out almost immediately, 16, uh, 1868. There were the Lakota tribes on the plains, the Apaches in the Southwest. Not, they never accepted the reservations. Remember the Cheyenne eventually did, but names like Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Victoria, Cochise, Geronimo, these were all Indian war leaders and the ones that fought this newly established Western army. And in each case, they lost to the whites. Richard, I'm yep. going to interrupt you for a minute. You've got a whole lot of questions in the chat and about five minutes to answer them. Okay, well, let's <laughs> stop here. I have another little thing about cowboys. We've been talking a lot about Indians. Um, it's cowboys and Indians, but I don't have too much about cowboys. So we'll leave that. And uh, sure, let's go to the chat. Okay. The first question goes all the way back to the Bridgers rendezvous. Was yeah. there ever any concern about not wiping out the beaver population and what state did the rendezvous take place? The rendezvous were mostly in what is now Idaho and uh, Montana. And there probably was some concern, but as far as most of the mountain men or the Indians uh, were concerned, they wanted to kill, they wanted as many beaver pelts as possible because that's the way they could get for the Indians, the guns and the ammunition and the liquor. And for the mountain men, 
the um, the metal tools and the liquor. Um, so it took until about by about 1840, most of the beaver had been um, um, had been trapped. Tucson was founded continu and continuously populated earlier than Santa Fe. That's just common. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about it. populated earlier than Santa Fe. Of course, Tuc Tucson was on the way to Santa Fe for the Spanish uh, colonists. And so, yes, they were there earlier, but Tucson never became the colonial capital that Santa Fe was. Okay. How did the Texans deal with the Indians? By exterminating them. The Texas Rangers would generally either war against them like they warred against the Cheyenne and the Red River War and chase them out of Texas. They chased the Comanches out of Texas. There was a, a continuous um, battle between the Texas Rangers and the Comanches. The Apaches were mostly farther west in New Mexico. Um, but the Texas Rangers, the, the policy of the Texans was to eradicate the, the Indians, if they could, by chasing them out of Texas, because they only cared about Texas. Um, but if not, to eliminate them. Okay. Did Texas freedom breed more independent-minded states' right efforts in other Western states in the succeeding decades? Um, I think the first time that Texas became kind of a national leader was with the oil. After Spindletop, Texas actually became the place where oil would be, oil policy would be made for the whole country. And indeed, the Texas Railroad Commission, of all things, became the largest oil regulator, certainly in Texas, but their policies were then implemented in other states that had oil, mostly Oklahoma, which had its own oil rush, um, even in, in California, and then east in Pennsylvania, where there was also oil. But the Texas Rail Commission was the basic leader in the whole country. And with that, Texas in other, other ways uh, became a leader in, in the country. Okay. Um, Texas is still on the fringe of today's society, a comment. <laughs> well, and, Texas is always Texas. And followed by, I live in Texas, but have lived in many other states too. Many Texans still have a more independent minded states right or still more independent-minded states' rights efforts than just about every other state. That's true. That's probably true. Ask Governor Abbott. <laughs> and, uh, um, Lou, a Lou asked, was money paid to Mexico when Texas became independent? Hell no. Um, yes. There was supposed, supposedly in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the United States purchased the Mexican secession. But I don't know what the amount was, but it was, you know, trivial compared to the uh, to the size of the secession. And uh, but anyway, the answer to the question is yes, there was some. And then we have a comment, in my opinion, they need to join the nation's power grids so they don't have multiple fa power failures in the winter for days. And that's got to be referring to Texas. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yes. More? Um, thank you so much. This is one of my favorite hours. OK, um, very interesting. Yeah, OK. Car warranty call, FYI, in 1906, San Francisco quake that destroyed the city in the same magnitude that hit Turkey and Syria destroyed thousands of homes and life. Yes. 
um, please provide a website or other lead to reading list. Okay, if you are with Ollie, you got it in your mail from Ollie. If you're from um, AARP, it was sent out through AARP. And what I would recommend is what I did in that little note is start with the Library of Congress, American Memory, and with a plug for George Mason, uh, the George Mason website, uh, History Matters, has long lists of, uh, of links that get to different parts of, um, of the history that we've been talking about. You can also Google any of the specific things, but there again, I would warn people, there's a lot of websites that I don't think you should trust, but if you stick to websites that are run by universities, by uh, historical societies, by archives, um, you probably do pretty well. Okay, could you please recommend a good book on the cattle drives? Ah, I will look that up. I don't actually know off the top of my head. It's not a part of the history that I've gone into very, very much, but cattle drives, I will certainly do that and I will email it to everybody. Okay. There's a comment, many of us in the East have a hard time understanding this, not quite sure the context on that. Sorry, understanding what? That's what I said, I don't quite understand the context. Okay. <laughs> Does the federal government rent some of the land to people or entities for communities? Oh yeah. Um, most of the national forests and a lot of the uh, rangelands are leased out and those leases are um, you know very controversial in in many respects but the national forests for instance they're owned by the federal government but the logging that occurs there is done by private companies um, so leasing out land is is a major business for the federal government Okay. Uh, I'm actually over time. I'm going, I made it so I can capture these questions this time. So I will send you the chat. Okay. Um, Cause there's a lot more and they keep coming in. <laughs> oh my. Yes. Uh, you just can't cover this kind of uh, history in, in uh, an hour and a half, but um Yes. Anyway. So I will send you the chat questions. You can respond to them yeah. either at the beginning of the next class or via email, however you want to handle it. Um, I, I think I will try to get some emails because the next class is going to be quite different. Yeah. A lot of fun, actually. That'll be about the mythological West. Yeah. This was about the actual West, uh, but there was a whole West created in novels and movies and theme parks. And that's what we'll be talking about next week. Okay. And there are lots of thank you very much and wonderful classes in these chats too. So you'll have the opportunity to read those. Okay. And thank, you. thank you for everything. And we will see you again next week. Thank you. I will be here.